so I am happy to introduce uh, Patrick Schneider today as the first speaker of the semester. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Yeah, so my talk will be about a thing that is called depth measures. Many of you might have heard at least of some of those before. So there's some names that very often pop up with these depth measures, which are, for example, Tuki and Tverberg. And I guess these might be names that you've heard before. But so what is the idea of uh, depth measures? So let's say we have some point set uh, here. Due to the limitations of my screen, it is in R2, but the general ideas work in any dimension. So these are the black points. And I want to find some good representative of that point set. And I give you two candidates here. So I give you either this green point or this red point here. Now, which one, in your opinion, is a better representative? Does anybody have some opinion about that? Green. 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 OK, so I guess most people would say green. Uh, because intuitively to us, it's kind of easy to see. It's clear that this is more in the center of the point set than the red one. The red one kind of looks like it's very far outside. So the question is, how can we formalize this intuition that we have? How can we make this notion of being further inside the point set a bit more precise? And that's where depth measures come in. So the idea of a depth measure is that we assign a depth to a point with, in such a way that what we intuitively would think is deeper within the point set actually gets a higher depth. <clears throat> and there's quite many ways to do that. And I'm going to give you two examples now, which are, well, two key depth and Tverberg depth. So let's start with uh, two key depth. So the, oops, here we go. The two key depth of a query point Q, so depth of the query point Q. So that is the red point that I have here. This is just the minimum number of points in any closed half space containing Q. So it's the minimum number of, well, and here the other points are black, black points in any closed half space which contains Q. So this notion of depth was introduced by, you guessed it, Tuki. Um, I think it was in the 50s or 60s. And so, so Tuki was a statistician and he was hoping that this would be a way to generalize the concept of medians to higher dimensions, especially because the, the definition only on, relies on the combinatorial structure of things. So there are no distances involved, which hopefully would make this thing more robust against outliers. Just like in the 1D case where a median is more robust than the mean. So let us look at this example. What is the two key depth here? So for example, we can find a half space which contains Q, which only contains four of the black points. Um, if you look at it a little bit and hoping that I didn't draw it wrong. That's actually the best you can get. So here the depth is four. So that is one option, but there's other options that we can do. Another option is the Tverberg depth. <clears throat> so the Tverberg depth of Q, of a query point Q, is just the maximum number of vertex disjoint simplices that we can draw, <clears throat> each of which contains Q. So is the maximum of Q 
whose intersection contains Q. Uh, where of course the <clears throat> vertices of the simplices have to be black points. So let us look at this example here. Um, we can, for example, take this one, which contains the red point, and we can take this guy here, and finally this triangle. Um, I guess you all believe me that that's the best that we can do because we have used up all the points. So under this definition, even though it's the same point set, the depth of the red point is three. So these, these definitions might be different and there's quite a few um, depth measures that have been introduced in the literature. Um, but somehow there is no general theme. So all of these are kind of ad hoc construction and there is no really underlying theory of how these depth measures behave. And so that is kind of my starting point for this project was well, is there some way we can unify at least certain of the properties that these depth measures have? Um, let me maybe also mention that quite a few of these measures appear quite naturally in discrete geometry. So for example, many of you might have heard of the so-called center point theorem. Um, and you can phrase the center point theorem as a theorem about depth measures, because it just says that, well, there is, a, there is always a point which has large QQ depth. So the center point theorem, that just says, well, for any underlying black point set, there exists some query point Q such that the two key depth of this point is at least well, the size of S divided by D plus one. So PD, that's notation for two key depth. Okay, this is probably not the formulation of the center point theorem that you know, but it's in the end exactly the same. Now, on the other hand, uh, Tverberg depth is named after Helge Tverberg, even though he did not come up with uh, this depth measure, but the reason why it's called Tverberg depth is because it's very related to Tverberg's theorem. And one way to phrase Tverberg's theorem is also in terms of Tverberg depth. And it essentially just says the same as the center point theorem, but for a different depth measure. Okay, so two very famous results in discrete geometry. If you take this viewpoint of depth measures are actually just saying that there exist deep points for these two depth measures. Okay, so let me try and kind of go a bit away from concrete depth measures and start looking at more general things that we can do, which still makes sense in the world of depth measures. So what I'm gonna be considering in this uh, talk are what I call combinatorial depth measures. And so a combinatorial depth measure, well, we, we have some underlying point set. So these were the black points before, which we call S. And so this, uh, this S to the R to the D is just a set of all possible point sets in RD finite point sets. And then we have a query point Q, which is also a point in RD. And to this combination, we assign some number. And <clears throat> I say that these depth measures are combinatorial if this only depends on the relative position of S and Q. So if if you know what an order type is, you can say that it only depends on the order type of S and Q, but I don't want any distances in there. So it's really a combinatorial thing. 
And one other thing that would be very nice and that I require is that all of these depth measures, if you plug them into R1, so that's a dimension that we generally understand much better than higher ones, then they should give the standard depth in R1. So what is the standard depth in R1? Well, let's draw some points. So this is R1. And let's have some points here. And now, well, the standard depth just it assigns depth zero out here, depth one after the first point, depth two after the second, depth three, and this one in the middle, because we have an odd number, this single point here gets depth four. Um, you can check that both Tukey depth and Tverberg depth actually give this standard depth on R1. And I guess if you would ask anybody to come up with a nice depth measure in R1, this is probably what people would come up with. Also, there exist deep points for the standard depth in R1. And not surprising, that's exactly the median. So this also kind of shows why these combinatorial depth measures can give us a generalization of the concept of medians in higher dimensions, because the deepest point under the standard depth in R1 is in fact the median. And so we can hope that some nice properties still hold in higher dimensions. So <clears throat> I guess one of the first questions that I wanna ask is the following, how different can these measures be? especially in higher dimensions. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Not. Okay, good. So let's- I have a question. Yes, of course. Are you going to introduce uh, some sort of axioms? Yes. That they have to obey? Yes. That is the next step. Thank you. Good. Actually, it's the step after that. So first of all, I'm going to show you why we probably need some axioms. Because first of all, I'm going to show you a uh, depth measure, which is combinatorial and everything, which I don't particularly like. And you will see why. And this depth measure is the convex hull peeling depth. So how is it defined? Well. It's in the name. So we start peeling off convex hulls. So we look at this point set and then we have this convex hull. Um, we delete it. Then we have a remaining point set. We look at the convex hull that remains. We delete it. And so forth. And then we have actually uncovered the red query point. And so in this case, the red query point has uh, depth two because we needed to do this process two times until we have uncovered the red point. Okay. Now, if we look at this in R1, well, that gives us exactly the standard measure, right? Because out here, we don't need to take away anything. As soon as we take the leftmost and the rightmost point, which is the convex hull in R2, well, then we get depth one, we get depth two here, and that one gets depth three. So this actually gives us the standard depth in R1. However, in certain cases in higher dimensions, and by higher, I mean already starting at two, we can lose quite a lot of information. Well, because if our underlying point set is just in convex position, then the deepest point that we have has depth one. So there is no hope for a kind of a center point type like result for this convex hull peeling depth because we can always just look at convex position and then it's really just 
essentially the indicator function of the convex hull, which can still be interesting, but from the point of view of depth measures, it is a bit boring. So we probably want to have some other things. Yes. yes. I thought there was a question. Okay. So as Boris suggested, let's try and introduce some axioms and hope that these axioms give us something nice. Um, here is a first try that I have. Um, if I say first try, there might be a second try. I'm not sure if I have time for that, but there's different things that you can do. And so these first things I call super additive depth measures. And the axioms are really just some properties that any nice depth measure should have. So the first one that really just says that, well, if we add a point to our underlying black point set, then the depth should not change too much. So it should change at most by one, which if you look at 2K depth or at Tverberg depth, actually is what happens. The second axiom <clears throat> says that, well, if we are not in the convex hull, then we should have depth zero, which again, for both 2K depth and Tverberg depth happens. The third axiom says that if we are in the convex hull, then we should have depth at least one. So that is really just here to prevent that our depth measure is just a constant zero function. Because again, that would be quite boring. And then the fourth one, that is where the name comes from, that is the super additivity condition that says that if we have two black point sets, um, <clears throat> Then if we look at the union of those two and we have a fixed query point, then the depth of the query point with respect to the union should be at least the depth or the sum of the depths with respect to the single point set. So let me give a small example. So if this is our query point and then we have a first point set, let me draw this in green. That one is a bit of boring one. So here the depth is just one. And then let me not take, maybe not take orange, but blue. So we have some other point set here. And here we have depth, let's say one. Here we have depth, let's say one. Well, then the depth of this red point should be at least two. Okay. Um, why these axioms? Well, one thing that you can say about these axioms is that they are actually necessary and sufficient for giving standard depth in R1. Um, the necessary part we're actually gonna see in a, uh, sorry, the sufficient part we're gonna see is slightly more general right now. The necessary part, uh, you just play around a little bit. You delete <clears throat> one, of the axioms and then you will see that you can do something which is not the standard depth measures. For example, if you take away the fourth condition, so the super additivity and only look at the first three, then the indicator function of the convex hull would be a depth measure, which is not the standard depth measure and so on. But um, yeah, that it's sufficient. We're actually gonna do something slightly more general because we actually can show two things. So first of all, the first observation that we have is if some depth measure rho satisfies just the first two conditions. So, so it satisfies conditions one and two, well, then it is always bounded from above by two depth. no matter <clears throat> what point sets and query point we take. Okay, well, why is that? Let us prove this because it's actually a very short proof. So let's just assume that the 2P depth is K. Okay, so that means we have our query point 
And we have some points over here. And we do have some half space. Whoops, sorry. We have some half space which contains exactly K of the black points. And every half space contains at least K points. Okay. Well, but this means that we can remove some K points and then the query point will be on the convex hull, uh, outside of the convex hull, because we just remove all the points in, in this half space over here. So there exists K points. Let's call the set of these K points S prime such that the query point is not in the convex hull of S without S prime. Okay. So in particular, after removing these points, the query point has depth zero. So why? Well, that's what axiom number two tells us. Um, but now if we add those points back, we know from axiom number one that for each point that we add, the value can increase at most by one. So in total, the value can increase at most by two. Uh, sorry, by K. Okay. And as I said before, if we look at this in R1, two k depth kiss is the same as standard depth in R1. So this just shows that every point needs to have depth, at least the depth of the standard depth. Uh, sorry, at most. The at least part comes now. And that's the second observation. So if some measure only satisfies three and four, then it's bounded from below by Tverbeck depth. Let me remove this. Then it's bounded from below by Tverbeck depth. Okay. And the proof is similarly short. So let's assume that Tverberg depth is K. So let us have some partition into simplices. We have K simplices. There's a partition that witnesses this depth. Uh, by definition, Q lies in each of these simplices. So, and thus by axiom number three, we have that the depth of our, uh, of our query point is at least one for each of these simplices. And then if we throw all of them in together, well, we have the superadditivity. So we need to have at least depth K after we, all, after we throw in all of them. Okay, and again, in R1, Tverberg depth is the same as the standard depth. So that shows that if we have these four axioms, every point is also bounded from below by the standard depth. And so we just have that any depth measure which satisfies these four axioms in R1 gives us the standard depth. Um, but in general, we still have that all of these um, depth measures are not too far apart. So if rho is any super additive depth measure,
Well, then it is sandwiched between, whoops, two key depth and fairback depth. And further on, it's actually not hard to show, I'm not gonna do that, but also Tverberg depth can be bounded from below by a factor of two key depth. And this factor is at least one over D. So if you have Tverberg depth K, then you also have two key depth at least K over D. And so in particular, Everything that we did so far just says that, well, if we have super additive depth measures, which include two key depth, which include Tverberg depth, but also some others, then all of them are constant fraction approximations of each other. I mean, the constant depends on the dimension, but they cannot be too far apart from each other. So even though they might have wildly different definitions and they might differ locally, they still cannot differ too much in some sense. Okay, um, let me give one other application why I think that these super additive depth measures are interesting. And that brings me to the second part of my talk. So if there's any questions about what we have done so far, now is a good time to ask. Does not seem to be the case. So for the second part, I wanna look at a conjecture from discrete geometry. It's the so-called cascade conjecture, which uh, Gil Kalai came up in the, I think, 70s, if I remember correct. And he didn't phrase it that way, but it is essentially a conjecture about Tverberg depth, which has been open since the 70s. And few people have tried because it doesn't sound too hard, but it turns out to be quite notorious. Um, so what is? the cascade conjecture. Uh, let us look at the depth regions. So I say that the alpha region of a depth measure is just a set of all points that have depth, at least alpha. So each depth measure will give us some nested set of depth regions. Um, and for the cascade conjecture, at least for the original version, we particularly are interested in the regions of Tverberg depth. So let's look at these two examples. Let's start with the left example. What is the region of Tverberg depth one? So the set of all points that have Tverberg depth at least one. Well, that is just the convex hull, right? So that's convex hull and everything inside, which I'm now not gonna draw. What is the region of Tverberg depth two. So for that, well, we see that we kind of have two um, triangles that we can intersect for this one and this one. And so we get the intersection of those is a hexagon. And everything in there in this hexagon has Tverberg depth two because this is the partition that witnesses that. So this whole hexagon is already a part of it. Let me now also draw the inside. Um, in this example, it turns out there's nothing else because well, any other point that you look at, you can see that you can put it into at most one triangle, particular because they also have uh, two key depth one. So it's, really just this thing in here. And then finally, well, what about Tverberg depth three? Here turns out that we have some kind of a degenerate pos uh, position and we actually do have a single point of Tverberg depth three, which is this intersection point of the three diagonals. So the R simply says will be the two, uh, the, the, the one dimensional, edges, which are also simplices. And so their intersection point is also, uh, is, uh, yeah, it's a point of Tverberg depth three. So we have a zero dimensional 
Bellberg region. And then starting from four, you don't find anything. Let us look at the next example. Again, convex hull is just depth one. And now for depth two, it turns out that we actually only have this pentagon here, but not its inside. Why is that? Let us take some point, for example, that point here. Well, then it's witnessed by this edge here and this triangle here. And similarly for everything else. However, if we look at the point inside, it doesn't lie on any edge. So it would have to be in the inside of two triangles. Well, we only have five points. So that will not be possible. And yeah, so we also don't have any point of Trebek depth three. So on the left side, it looks quite nice. Everything is convex. On the right side, there are some weirder things happening. Now, what does the cascade conjecture say? Well, so for the, because we, we can look at these regions and we say, okay, TI, that is just the dimension of the ith region. So of the Tverberg depth region for a point set S and of depth I. So all of those have some dimension um, where we say that the dimension of the empty set is just minus one. Okay. And then the cascade conjecture by Gilkalai is the following very easy condition. Just says, well, if we sum this up, starting from one all the way to the number of points that we have, if we sum up all these dimensions, then we should get at least zero. Uh, pretty easy to state, not so hard and uh, not so easy to prove. So let us look at these examples here. So here, um, the dimension of Tverberg depth one, well, that's two. We have a two dimensional convex hull. Then for two, sorry, for two points, we still have a two dimensional for depth two. For depth three, we have a zero dimensional. We still have one single point with Tverberg depth three. And then for four, five and six, it's empty. So we always have a minus one. And so if we sum this up, two plus two plus zero, and then minus three, well, the sum is one, which is at least zero. So in this example, it works. Let's see over here. So again, we have a two dimensional convex hull. The next part is only one dimensional, right? So we only have the boundary of this pentagon. So that's a one dimensional thing. And then starting from three, we don't have anything. So here, if we sum it up, we get exactly zero. So lucky us, still works here. Yeah, and so this conjecture has been open since the 70s, mostly open, I should say. So it's known to be if the dimension is two, then it's true. Uh, if the dimension is one, it's also true. Uh, that is not hard to show. Um, but yeah, if the dimension is two, then it's known to be true. And it's also known to be true if the point set is in so-called strongly general position. Um, I don't want to define what this is. So general position means uh, no d plus two, no, sorry, no d plus one on a hyperplane. Strongly general position also in excludes these kind of pencil degeneracy. So it's a very, very strong assumption on the underlying point set. Um, but in this case, it's also known to be true. The conjecture by Kalai doesn't even assume general position. 
and even for general position, it's still open, but in particular for arbitrary position, it's widely open. Okay, but now phrasing this in time in terms of Tverberg depth, of course, we can ask the same question for any kind of depth measure, right? So we can just look at the dimension of some region. We write down the sum and we ask, well, does it give us at least zero? So the conjecture can be generalized to any depth measure. And I will call a depth measure for which this uh, cascade condition holds. I will call this a cascading depth measure. So this defines us the cascading depth measures. So the original conjecture would be that Tverberg depth is cascading, but insert any other depth. Uh, it, there are, of course, depths which are not cascading. Uh, one example being this convex hull peeling depth that I've shown you before, because yeah, in some cases we really just have a full dimensional convex hull and nothing else. And adding up a D together with as many minus ones as you want, at some point you will be lower than zero. But so what I could prove is the following that many depth measures, or at least some, are actually cascading. So that's a word from last year. So let rho be some super additive depth measure. And I need one additional condition. I need that the... Um, alpha regions, so the depth regions, that they are convex and compact. But if these two um, properties are given, well, then the resulting depth measure is cascading. So in particular, it is known that the depth regions for Tukey depth are compact and convex. So Tukey depth is cascading. So that actually also solves a, a question of Kalai because when many people failed with his original question, and his original conjecture, he started relaxing it more and more. And in one talk where I found some slides, he actually asked the same question for Tukey depth. Again, he phrased it slightly different, but it was essentially the conjecture to whether Tukey depth is cascading. And it says there on the slides that he thinks that this should be doable. Uh, so it turns out that this is indeed doable. Now, it unfortunately doesn't show the uh, cascade conjecture in its original form because, well, Tverbeck depth, as we can see here, the depth regions might not be convex. So the boundary of a pentagon is not convex. Um, yeah, so in the reminder, remainder of my talk, I, I do have one hour, right, Bobis? Okay, I see Adam giving me a thumbs um. up. Yeah, yeah, sure. So in the remainder of my talk, I will try to at least give some idea of the proof. And the proof actually goes in two steps. And the interesting part about this is that the first step only uses super additivity. And the second part only uses the fact that the depth regions are convex. So in particular, if you find some way to prove the second part for Tverberg depth, well, then you have proven the original conjecture. So I think also the approach might be interesting for the general conjecture. Um, I have tried, also discussed it with a few people. Uh, we failed miserably so far, but 
who knows, maybe it just takes one nice idea for it to work. So yeah, these are two steps. The first one just says, well, if we have uh, two point sets whose median regions intersect, and here the median region is just the region of largest depth that is still there. And we can show that the cascade condition holds for both of them. Then the cascade condition also holds for the union. So let me give an example. So if the if this is the first point set like that, and this is the second point set like that. So they are both quite boring and small, but their median region is just interior. So they have an intersection. Then if we draw the union of those now just in one color, well, then the cascade conjecture should still hold. And actually this is the point set that we had before um, where I assume that these diagonals intersect. So here it holds. And then the second one, the second step is just, well, if we have some point set and a depth measure, and now I have to assume that the depth regions are compact and convex, well, then we can partition it into two parts whose median regions intersect. And with these two things, I guess the, the proof of the theorem is then quite easy because it's really just induction. So you take however many points you want to have, and then you can split it up into two points, into two subsets, which are smaller. At some point, you will have only D plus one points, and there it's not hard to show that um, the cascade condition holds. And then you just make induction, and uh, it holds for all the point sets. Now, unfortunately, there is a slight caveat in this uh, second step. And it is that I don't actually know if this lemma, the way I phrase it here, is actually correct. I need one more thing to make it correct. And I need what I call weighted point sets. So weighted point sets, we assign weights to, to every point. And it's actually more general than the original one. Um, but I need it because in my partition that I have, I might have certain points that I put to both sides. So let me tell you exactly what I mean by weighted point sets. So it's really just that, yeah, to each point, we also assign some weight. And if we want to look at the union of two weighted point sets, then the underlying point set should be the union, really just in the set theoretic way. And also the weight of each point should just be the sum of the respective weights in the two parts. And for a partition, I also want to require that there is one point which is completely in the first set and one point which is completely in the second. So that will still allow me to do induction because then still the sizes of the underlying point sets will decrease. So just as a small illustration, so if we have this point set here, where now let's say this point here has weight five, this one has weight three, weight two and weight one, then we can partition it into two subsets, for example, like this, where this guy gets weight two, this one gets all of the weight, uh, this one gets weight one half and another point set where then this one has weight three, this one has all of the weight and this one has weight one half. So this is a valid partition. And if these are the uh, partitions that I consider, well, it turns out that then my lemma two works. All right. I have a quick question. Yes. The weight can be any real numbers? The weights I mean, can be any real numbers, yes. Positive, right? Positive, yes, all positive. Yeah. Uh, but of course, we do have a finite point set, so there is no funky business with infinity or so going on. So everything is still relatively nice. Okay, 
let me let me skip the proof of lemma one because I actually think that the proof of this uh, partition theorem is more interesting in particular because I think what I am doing might be quite of an overkill, but that's the best I could come up with. Um, so here is how this partitioning works. We know that strict, if I, if I give you some finite set S, then the strict subsets of S are in bijection with the vertices of a barycentric subdivision of a simplex with the vertices S. So let me tell you what I mean by that. Again, my set will be quite small just because of the limited number of dimensions that I have on the screen. So my set is just uh, one, two, three. And so this is a simplex on three vertices and then I do the barycentric subdivision. And well, this vertex here corresponds to element one, this one corresponds to element two, this one to element three, and then everything on the barycentric subdivision is the union of the vertices of that face. So this one will be two and three, this one is one and three, and this one is one and two. Okay, and this way all the strict subsets are at some vertex of this barycentric subdivision. Um, now, why do I need weighted subsets? Well, using weights, this actually extends to the entire boundary of the, of the simplex just by linear extension. So we can linearly extend this to the whole boundary. And these are also still these strict subsets because the underlying, uh, there is no point on the boundary where all the underlying points are used. So in particular, the strict weighted subsets now are in bijection with the boundary of the simplex. And the boundary of the simplex, topologically speaking, is just a sphere, right? So that's a sphere of dimension, well, the same dimension that we have before. So it's minus one. Okay, there's one more thing that we can notice. So in this original barycentric subdivision, we have a relatively natural antipodality where we kind of identify some vertex with the opposite face. And under this antipodality, well, a subset actually gets mapped to its complement. Um, so let me write that down. So we have a natural antipodality So if some point P gives the subset, let's call it SP, then we have that S minus P is just the complement of this subset. And that also extends linearly to the weighted setting. Furthermore, now comes the assumption of compactness and convexity. Well, the The depth regions are compact and convex. So in particular, also the median region is compact and convex. So if we just take the barycenter of the median region, we get a single point. So we might as well assume that the median region is a single point. Even more, we can assume that if we start moving around on this simplex, this uh, point moves continuously.
In this assumption, I'm actually throwing quite a lot of things under the rug. If you really just take the very center, uh, the very center of the median region, this will not be true. For the sake of this presentation, let's assume that it is. Um, there are ways how you can make it that way. But just let me put a bit of an asterisk here because I'm cheating a little bit. Okay, but so if we assume this, well, then the median region gives us a continuous function. So the median region gives us a continuous function which takes any point on the boundary of the simplex and then any point will give us some weighted subset. This weighted subset will give us a median and this median will be a point in R to the D. And now we also know that the dimension of this thing here is at least S minus one. And we had the assumption that we have at least uh, D plus two points because for D plus one points, you can show it directly. So actually the dimension of this sphere is at least D. So we have a continuous function from a sphere of dimension at least D to R to the D. Um, and that is of course bosuk ulam And so the bosuk ulam theorem then tells us that there is some point on the boundary of the simplex such that the two medians coincide. And because these two sets, SP and S minus P are really just complements, this P then gives us the desired partition. And that is the proof. So we started off with something completely combinatorial, we had to throw in weights to be able to use Bosu Gula. Um, I don't know if this is the best that we can do. And we also really needed the compactness because if the depth regions are not compact and convex, then everything falls apart. So yeah, let me summarize what I've shown you. So I've shown you these uh, super additive depth measures and we have seen by pretty easy methods that locally they cannot differ too much. But we could show that if we have convex depth regions, well, then these depth measures are actually cascading. And so in particular, 2K depth is, cascade, is cascading. But unfortunately, the proof does not go through for the original conjecture, which is for Tverberg depth, because the regions are not convex. And let me mention that there's also a relaxation where instead of looking at the Tverberg depth regions, we look at the convex hull of the Tverberg depth regions. You can still ask the same question for that. And then of course, the depth regions are nice and convex. So we can use lemma two. But the problem is that the depth measure that gets defined in this way is not super additive anymore. So we cannot use lemma one anymore. So even for that weaker conjecture, we unfortunately still cannot show anything. And yeah, so finally, I think this uh, lemma two part, in, in my opinion, really seems like a bit of an overkill for what we are trying to do. So it would be very easy to, uh, very nice to see a kind of more elementary proof in some sense where we don't need weights, where it really works for point sets um, for any kind of depth measure, because that might be interesting for the general uh, conjecture. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, if anyone has any questions, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, say something. Or you can So Patrick, if, if I understand you correctly, um, if Kali's original conjecture is true, then, then all combinatorial depth measures that satisfy axioms three and four are cascading? Yes, yes. 
Okay. So Kalai's conjecture is strictly stronger than yeah. what I have shown here. Yeah. So do you know any examples of uh, um, measures between Tukey and Fairberg that, that still have convex compact uh, um, alpha regions? No natural ones from the literature, no. So that, I mean, that's an interesting question that I actually haven't looked at. I mean, it's true for two key depths, but in theory, it could be that two key depth is the only one. I would doubt that, but I, I haven't looked at that. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can probably define something weird where you start off with maybe two key depth and in certain cases you take two key depth, but not in all of them and kind of some mixed thing, but that, that would be a very unnatural measure in some sense. So mm -hmm. I don't know of any natural definition. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, that was great. So in, in your original description, you uh, considered the, uh, these sets to uh, be disjoint in some sense. Supposing you look at, in the two-dimensional case, mm -hmm. you, you could look at uh, triangles that contain the point, and there may be other triangles that don't contain the point and somehow or other use the information uh, about the relative sizes of those numbers to, to do something useful. Does that make any sense? Um, I, I, I can make some sense of it. I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, but uh, so there is a, another depth measure, which is called simplicial depth, which is really just count the number of simplices that contain the query point. So that's, or another way you, you look at the fraction of those uh, and choose yeah. e plus one that contain it. And that is also a very well studied thing. Um, you can also bound it from below by Tukey depth. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it satisfies most of the axioms that I introduced, but not axiom one. And that is actually also an interesting question. Can you fit simplicial depth somehow in this framework? So you, you can make it satisfy axiom one by just doing some kind of normalization. So, I mean, if you add one point, even in R2, there's many, there's generally more than one triangle using that yep. point, which contains the query point. So you can just, for example, divide by however many you could get. And then of course, you're not gonna increase by more than one because you have normalized, but then you're losing super additivity. And so it could be, it's, that's also an interesting question that I tried to play around with a bit of, is there some way to divide by something maybe more intelligent, divide by some other measure? Um, which would bring this into that framework um, or show that it cannot be done. And that then of course heavily relates to the so-called first selection lemma. So the first selection lemma just essentially gives you deep points with respect to the simplicial depth. And... Yeah, that, yeah, so that you, you did address sort of the spirit of what I was talking about, but one could also perhaps instead of, in the case of two dimensions, look at sets uh, either convex or otherwise of size four or- Ah, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I- Yeah, you, you could define a measure like that, definitely. Okay. Uh, the only issue there that I see, if, if you again look at my axioms, is that as soon as you say size four, you could be in the convex hull and still have depth zero because right. well, the right. convex hull might just, you might only have three points to start with, right? But it definitely would make sense, yeah. 